Okay. So I've been drinking and I've decided that I am best suited to discuss unpopular Avatar opinions because I don't have a filter. But it, it needs to be said. Kyoshi is a coward. I said it. How is Kyoshi a coward? Okay. Um, I really don't remember the episode name. I'm pretty sure... Wait, no, I do. It's, it's like the one where they eat the little, um, the little dough people. Kyoshi is been in current memes... We see a lot of Kyoshi being considered the strong uh, avatar willing to kill people. She has what Aang wants and desires and lacks because she's willing to kill. She's powerful. She's a warrior. I'm about to tear this the fuck down. And don't get me wrong. I think that Kyoshi is a well-written character. But we are conflating this too much with her being a good person and a good avatar, which she is not. Let me explain why. Kyoshi was kind of just um like what, what's the word um hashtag centrist and as chin the conqueror was taking over the entire fucking continent she was just chilling on kyosha i'm like haha at least it's not me meanwhile she's like these op like fucking dragon ball z level powers and could have like ended his ass but instead was like it's okay i'm chilling on this island that worships my ass i'm super tall and awesome and sexy who cares meanwhile chin the conqueror takes over this entire fucking continent this entire continent and only when he gets to kyoshi's like little area which is not yet an island because it's still like attached wherever it's like probably a peninsula i don't fucking remember geography or whatever the fuck that's called um and she was like oh no not me now that it's affecting me it's a fucking issue uses her op powers to push him away doesn't even intend to kill him she was like straight up honest about this she's like i didn't mean to kill him he was just standing there it's not like i cared which like once again I am completely fine with the idea of, like, people killing people in these worlds. It's when it's necessary. I get it. I get it. But we're crediting Kiyoshi for this standpoint when she didn't even mean to take it. She thought he was going to move. She, in her perspective, thought that Chin the Conqueror would move and be alive and continue to be a colonizing asshole to the rest of the world. And she was chill with that. So long as it didn't affect... Kyoshi Island. So she's like, all right, we're an island now. Do whatever the fuck you need to do. You can go colonize the world. I don't give a fuck with my OP powers that could kill your ass immediately and end that. Whatever. I don't care. But he happened to not move and died. And now we're crediting her as like killing this horrible person when she didn't really even intend to. Um, we need to address that. Kyoshi is honestly the least active avatar in terms of of like taking matters of the world into her hands and using her powers for good she didn't give a fuck about the world she was letting it suffer and i don't think we talk about that enough um let me just take a sip a sip a long sip a sip point in the beach episode is not good you may be saying you can't possibly mean that the beach episode's not good. Hear me out. The beach episode is not good. Why? And I want to clarify, this is like season three. I think the episode is called, quote unquote, the beach. I do think the scene with the fire is good. Perhaps, and I agree to this, that uh, Ty Lee and May's aspects of this are a little hand-fisted into the moment rather than sprinkled. Hand-fisted in the moment rather than sprinkled throughout the show. However, I do think that Azula and Zuko's parts of this episode are important and necessary. I think that we see a lot of Zuko's internal struggles cemented because this is the first time he's saying them out loud rather than hinting at them or applying them on the inside, which, like, Zuko's writing is fucking, like, chef's kiss. We love Zuko's writing, right? Like, I, we can all agree that Zuko is so well-written. And this is the first time we see Azula kind of admit that she's got insecurities. Because we see her as, like, strong, like, oh, nothing can, like, penetrate my, my like, external walls. I'm, like, fucking killing it. I'm a villain. My dad loves me. Hashtag no mommy issues here. But then in the beach episode, she's like, oh, no, no, no. I got mommy issues. And it's great. Because we see, like, she's like, oh, my own mother thought I was a monster. But... This is not what I'm talking about. I am a killjoy snowflake, and my problem with this episode lies not in the integrity of Zuko and Azula's relationships to their parents and the reflection of that into their life decisions and choices and paths to take. No, 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 no. 
My problem is that 14-year-olds are given fucking bouncy, vacuum-packed titties. And I'm not trying to say that if you're 14 and you got tits like that, you're not, like, a valid 14-year-old. You're valid and whatever. My problem is that there was... I, I, no one wants to admit it. There was some sexualization in this episode, specifically of Ty Lee. Why are we sexualizing a 14-year-old? You know, when my ass was seven years old and watching this, I was fine. I was vibing. But I'm 22 now. That's not sliding. Don't, don't sexualize 14-year-olds, guys. All right. Momo is irrelevant. Look, I love him. I have a little stuffed animal of him. He, he's my bitch. My brother and I often discuss this concept that um, side characters in animation are often very irrelevant. We do not need them. They are usually brought in to sell merchandise. Um, I can list a fucking few off the top of my fucking head. Any Disney movie. Look, I love the little um, lizard-ass, iguana, fucking chameleon-ass motherfucker from Tangled, but he does not add to the plot. You could be like, oh, he did this thing or this thing, but what you need to ask yourself is, could that action have been taken by one of the other characters in the show without changing the plot too much? The answer is almost always yes. They added that fucking iguana lizard motherfucker because, chameleon motherfucker, because they wanted to sell merchandise. Frozen 2. They did not need that other iguana lizard ass motherfucker chameleon thing. They just wanted to add them to sell merchandise. It's all about the money. When it comes to Disney, it's about the money. You have to understand that. But this bleeds into other areas. Like, this, like, no animation, or honestly, at this point, like, literally fucking anything is saved from this. You can look at, I just watched Kipo. That pig, Mondo, he's cute as fuck. Irrelevant. That bitch does nothing. And if he does something, it's something that could have easily written off as what the other character is doing. They wanted to add him because a cute little animal sidekick is fucking sellable. I'm clapping because I'm making points and I'm right. Momo goes with this. Do we love Momo? Yes. Is Momo adorable? Yes. Could anything Momo did be given to one of their characters? Yes. He was made because he's cute and a cute animal sidekick fucking sells. Do I think Appa's irrelevant? No. Appa actually, I think, had a lot more to do with the plot, which is why I think sometimes, and I'm not trying to say all animal sidekicks are bad, but look at the difference. Appa is something that tied into his past. He is their mode of transportation that you cannot take out of the show. And also, he has, like, a bit more of a personality. Um, honestly, I didn't have a third point, so I started talking and hoping something would come, but nothing came, so I'm just going to continue to the next. We ignore Iroh's past too much. Iroh is one of the best characters. We know this. We all agree. Iroh's great. However, I think it'd be silly to ignore the fact Homeboy committed some war crimes. Beep, 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 beep. So, not saying that you can't love Iroh and how great he is as a character. He's so well written. You can even love that bitch as a person because, you know, in terms of animation, we can kind of, like, try to push off a little more. But, like, let's not not bring into discussion the fact that he definitely committed like a lot of like murder and stuff doing unjust things for the fire nation at an adult age where we came and like tie it off like as well we're like oh he's like 14 no he was like an adult and he was all like what if i invaded your city haha <laughs> unless and that's not cool and like you can love iro i love iro like we gotta like look at it and be like okay he definitely killed a bitch or two in his day and age all you gotta do is admit that, and it's, like, that's the problem. People think that when you admit a flaw with a character, or, you know, the flaw of war crime, that it means that you can't appreciate the, how the character's written and how they are. You can. It's just, like, stop defending every single thing that your fave does, or else are they really your faves? All right, next point. The only perfectly developed ship, honestly, the only good ship in the show is Sokka and Suki. Ooh, are we getting into shipping mode? Because guess the fuck what, ladies? When I was seven years old and watching this, up until now, and I'm 22 fucking years old, and I just watched this the other month, I do not care about the main ships, which is, like, not... I'm not trying to say this in a pretentious way, because, like, I usually do care about ships and shows. I'm a shipper. Like, I'm fake. I'm, like, like in the, in the inside, I'm, like, always constantly, like, shipping shit. But, like, I did not care about the main ships in Avatar ever. Like... 
I did not care who the fuck Katara ended up with. And it kind of bothered me that sometimes people treated it as if this was an integral part of her character when it's fucking not, because she's, like, an icon by herself. But, like, that's not to say, like, if you ship something, like, with her, that's completely fine. Like, you're valid as hell, and, like, whatever you do, I'm sure you're fine. It's the people that think that's a necessity that bother me. I feel like sometimes her agency was stripped as a character because people were considering her as, like, a prize for Aang, which is not to say their relationship didn't work out, but, like... It felt a little bit forced at times and uncomfortable and a little bit like she wasn't about it. And, like, I think they tried to remedy that in the end. It's not that the intent wasn't there. They were directly saying that she didn't want it. But rather, like, towards the end, it felt a little much like they were, like, pushing it together because it was, like, the ending that Aang deserved. Yes, I'm a snowflake. I don't give a fuck. Anyway, and then, you know, I know that Zutar is popular, but I just, like, never vibed with that because, like, I feel like... Zuko had too much going on, on the inside. Like, I stand their friendship. Like, the Southern Raiders episode when she's all like, I'm not forgiving the dude who killed my mom, but I'm forgiving you, was one of, like, the... It's a cultural reset. And I get that. But I just don't see romantic tension there. And But, like, once again, if you do, I vibe, whatever. It's just, like, I'm not seeing it. Um, People that ship like fucking things like Sokka and Toph it feels weird age gap wise I'm not a fan of age gap specifically at that age when she's fucking like 12 um I don't know and like Mei and Zuko just seemed like any other like high school goth couple who are feeding off each other's negativity and like making each other's like mental health go down a drain and it's just like I don't know. None of them felt right. But let's fucking talk about uh, Sokka and Suki was very well developed um, because it demonstrated they both learned from each other. Um, He learned to be less of, you know, whatever the fuck he was in season one and like, you know, be like, drink his respect woman juice and like realize that it's okay for you to have um, insecurities as a man. Like, like, go fucking watch my himbo video. It's like valid. Um. I love Sokka. He's the best boy. He's the best character. But, like, he learned and he grew with Suki. And then she realized, you know, like, if you watch the Boiling Rock episodes, she also grew a lot and, like, was able to realize, like, okay, like, you know, this is, like, a teamwork thing. Like, if you watch them in the finale, they're, they're like, a fucking team. Like, they work with each other. Not, like, no one holds the sole agency in this couple. They work together. And I respect the fuck out of it. And I love them. And they were very well developed because you saw the shift in their relationships through the seasons. Um, I think it was like, I think they did, like, they reunited, like, Appa's Lost Days when Aang was all like, wake me up inside. And, like, when um, Sokka and Suki had to, like, talk about how, like, it shouldn't be one person protecting the other, but, like, instead, like, together. I I I vibed with it. It was good. Ozai is a poorly written character and villain. Yes. I also talk about this in my, um, I'm, like, self-plugging my videos that have, like, 40 views because I think I'm hot shit or something, but, um, Ozai, uh, yeah, he's a character, and, like, the characters, different ways to take characters video, I talk about how Ozai was kind of, like, what they had to do in order to bring in Azula, who's the actually well-written character and villain, but Ozai is, like, so mustache trolly, which, once again, I'm not sure if this is, like, a worldwide, like, commonly used term, or if it's something my brother said once, and I'm, like, holding on to it and using it in, like, a daily conversation, but he's mustache twirly, which means that Ozai's, like, whole thing is that he's, like, villainous for reasons that just seem cheap. Like, he's like, ooh, I'm gonna take over the world and be born from the ashes as the Phoenix King, <laughs> because of villainy. And it's like, all right, we get it. You're angsty, you want to be a villain, but, like, where's the substance? There really isn't any. And what I think hurts the most is that there was definitely, like, ways to give him substance in his relationship with Zuko and Azula's mom. Once again, I shit on the comics a lot in real life, like, the search, the search. I think with their backstory, like, Ozai and Zuko's mom, Ursa, Ursula, Ursa, 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 that bitch, uh, they could have had a well-written past. And I feel like that was something that felt a little bit short. Any fight was good. Like, as a fight scene, I do think it was well choreographed and well done. Like, I'm not saying it was bad, because I've seen final fights that were very lackluster. It's more of, like, throughout the series, he did not feel like a threat. And, like, his only purpose served as his relationship with um, Zuko and Azula. Like, his relationship to them is what made him interesting. And if you think about the actual tension between him and the protagonist, protagonist Aang, there was no relationship there. It didn't feel personal, which I like personally when 
the hero of the story and the antagonist of the story have a direct relationship, which 100% was there with Zuko and Aang throughout the first two seasons and, like, the whatever half of, like, the third season, but, like, it was not there between Aang and Ozai. And we need to admit that Ozai kind of was, like, in a hashtag irrelevant bitch. Aang shouldn't have killed Ozai. So this, like, opinion... I think is one that I probably wouldn't have put in here had there not been recent discourse on the finale in real life because everyone's watching um, Avatar in 2020, which is great. I love that everyone's watching it. Great memes and everything. And, like, one thing I've seen that people are saying is that, like, oh, Aang's a coward. He couldn't kill Ozai, blah, blah, blah. Which, like, let me get this straight. I 100% support characters killing bitches when they need to. Like, hashtag spoiler alert for Ruby volume six and onward. When Blake and Yang killed Adam, I was fucking for it. Like, because you never see, like, the heroes of a story kill the antagonist. In this case, I think everyone glorifying, this goes back to the Kyoshi thing, everyone glorifying Kyoshi's willingness to kill, that's fine, or whatever. But, like, Aang's whole thing, originating from him being an airbender, was that he didn't kill. Like, he wanted balance. He didn't, he didn't, as a person, want to kill people. I'm like, I know. I know what you're all going to say, little baby girls. I know you're saying in your head. Okay, but when he was the fucking, like, spirit-ass motherfucker in the Northern Water Tribe, we're not going to pretend that, like, some of the boats he, like, slapped the fuck out of was that big fish weren't killing some bitches in the Fire Nation. Yes. Probably. But was that Aang, really? Or was that, like, Aang in Avatar State, yep, yep, who, like, didn't really completely understand what he was doing. Not saying that, like, we can't, like, ignore the fact people died and shit, but, like, Aang's personal philosophy stands as him not wanting to be a murdery bitch, which is valid. That's his personal thing. And I think, whether or not you agree with this on a personal level, you have to understand that when you're writing a character, as they did writing Aang, you have to consider what the character would do, not what you would do. So as a mass, the viewers may say, oh, fuck, I would have killed Ozai, fuck Ozai, that would be poor writing to have Aang do that because that's not Aang's personal moral code and Aang doesn't want to kill anyone. So to have Aang kill Ozai would have felt very cheap in the end as like a way of writing off how else he could have done it. And like the whole taking his betting away, I think furthers what was touched on. I think I'm, I haven't seen Korra in ages, but Korra's first season with like benders versus non-benders where by taking away Ozai's bending to many people would not mean anything, but because... Ozai had transformed the concept of bending into this unjust inequality of power and, like, taking over the world and shit. It was demonstrating that his villainy originated from his corrupt mindset. And, like, that fucking scene was so well choreographed. Let me take a sip-sip of my drinky drink. Mm. 